coming. Uh, we want to impress upon you how important your job will be as trainer of other lobbyists. Um, many of you already know uh, a lot about how to do this, and one of the purposes of a meeting like this is to elicit that knowledge from you that you already have. Um, you can see from the uh, agenda that we want to start out reviewing the motivation and goals for doing what we're doing, then um, the methods of speaking and handling a reporter, for example, who might come up to you and ask you a question. Uh, what are the key talking points? And we want to role play that. You can see the uh, progression of our schedule there. And then um, our goal is to have at least 100 good, well-trained lobbyists uh, ready for February 11th. And so if there's, what, 20 of us, that means each of us needs to recruit about four people. Now, we're not represented geographically well yet here, so um, if you can get three or four people committed to come to lobby on uh, February 11th, that's a Wednesday, that's great, that would be our goal. And we'll have similar sessions in Ashland and La Grande, and we'll see if they can produce even more citizen lobbyists. Now, the term citizen lobbyist is being replaced because of the undocumented situation. Uh, they have to find that. <laughs> we also have to decide whether we like the word lobby. And I think maybe it's up to us to uh, reframe that in a favorable sense. We are lobbyists. Then we will have a timer. And that is uh, Cliff Goldman, and yeah, he... Eight minutes and 16 seconds to go for this second. Okay. <laughs> He's telling me how much time I have left to, uh, to speak. So each of us will have, say, five to ten minutes, and he will signal us when we're to within one minute of our limit, and then at the end he will stand up. Um, so it will be clear to the speaker that uh, the time is up. So mainly we're going to have fun, though. And um, we want to come out uh, feeling energized and armed for our uh, benign battles that we're going to uh, I'm, I'm Cliff Goldman. It's great to be here. I, I, and I just want to welcome you all to the Healthcare for All Oregon meeting. And we, what do we want? We want single-payer, universal, publicly funded health care. Is that right? Yes. 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 <laughs> That's right. Okay. And when do we want it? Now. now we want it right now, but the, the, the thing is, it takes more time than you think. Although I did see the paper this morning, or ac actually, it was Friday's paper, and what it said on Friday was that states un uninsured numbers lacerated since reforms start. It's nice that they use a medical term, <laughs> lacerated. <laughs> I need a doctor or God, or you can't have insurance. I don't know, but it says the number of uninsured Oregonians has dropped. 63 percent from 550,000 to 202,000 people since national health care reforms took offense, researchers said. And that's a picture of them going up. No, <laughs> so I saw that. That's what he yeah. said, yes. <laughs> I saw that and said, all right, even with affordable health care and the good that that has done, we still have a couple hundred thousand people that do not have health care in this state. Well, you know, it's really not easy. Now, I first heard about this, at, as, as many of you did, at the Vermont Workers Meeting in, uh, in um, the, the December of 2011 at Cascade PCC. I had never heard of this problem. I had never heard that people lacked health care. Hell, I had a, a doctor as a father there's no need to be concerned about health care, right? And the people I played golf with, they didn't have any problems either. And then, and, but then I heard about the Copernican Revolution and that the, the, the sun does not revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around the sun. So everything is not done for me. I found out that, God, there are people that don't have health care. And... The thing is, is that when we're in this fight to lobby and to talk to people and get them to sign the statement of support, you can't give up. 
I mean, sometimes you say, oh my God, what am I doing this for? Because I'm with the FAG group. Uh, let me explain what that is, the Portland Health Action Group, okay? And what I took upon myself is to go out and go door to door. Instead of, instead of just waiting for some kind of a, a neighborhood festival, which is great, but we got people all around us. And so I, I started doing this, that. Sometimes, you know, it's home and so forth, and well, I don't know if I want to do this. And so, but, but the thing is, you can't give up. Ed Schultz on, on, on MSNBC <clears throat> said, folks, you know, you can't give up liberal causes. What if, if you were an abolitionist in 1800, you got 63 years to go until Lincoln frees the slaves, and then they're only freed in the Confederate States, and then you have not until 1964, it's the civil rights in 65 until they can vote, and even today, we have voter suppression because, you know, we don't want to have voter fraud, right? So, and so there's still problems. Now, we're talking about going down to Salem, and we did this in 2013, February 4th, in 2013. And Michael Dem Dembro, who's now my, my state senator at that time, was the state rep, and he authored the bill that was introduced to the state legislature. And he stood on the steps, steps of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Capitol, and he said, you know, legislators really want this, but it's not gonna come from this building. He pointed to the Capitol. It's gonna come through the building. It's gonna come through the building because of pressure that people put on it, on, on the legislators. And that's the way it really is always done. FDR, in 1933, after he won his election, he's in his office, and his liberal supporters are there, and, and he said, you know, thank you very much for helping me to get his office, but, you know, I'm on your side, but you're going to have to make me do it. Because, you know, he's got other constituents now, and there's politics involved as well. So it, but, so it comes from the people. Now... When this, this program gains momentum, people are afraid that the lobbyists are going to inundate the state capital with money. And how can you beat that? Well, well, doc, Dr. Sam Metz has a solution to that. He, 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 he holds up a pen and he says, this is how you combat money, is that you have people yourself and, and as many people as you can find, and you, and you write to your legislator and said, and you put three points in there. Number one, my family is suffering and so am I because of lack of adequate health care. Number two, I want you to do something about it. And number three, if you don't do something about it, I can't support you. And by the way, I'll contact you next month. And just, just to have more and more things like that. Now, I was, I was campaigning in in 2013 for Chris Gorchuk out in, 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 in the Gresham area. And at the end of the day, term came, came into the headquarters and Senator Lori Monis Anderson was sharing that campaign office. And I introduced myself to her and just <laughs> talked about stuff. And, and, but I, 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 I knew her, okay? Well, after the, after the February rally, I made an appointment to see her a couple weeks later. It was my first lobbying effort. I was in the elevator going up to her office, and I said, oh, my God, what am I doing? Jesus, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm nervous. I'm scared. I stutter. My God, it, it's going to be. And then I remember the words that inspire me a lot from Hugh Downs who says, if you want to get over fear, go out and scare yourself. <laughs> and, and so I said, hey, this, this is good. I'm scared. This is great. And so that turned me around. I said, I'm going to go in there. So I, 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 I went in there, talked to her, and she was very nice, but she wouldn't commit to it. She wouldn't, and she's a Democrat. She's a chair of the Senate Health Committee and a former nurse. And she said, well, I'm going to see how the governor's plan goes. I'm going to see how affordable health care. And, 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 and I said, Senator Anderson, this is not delivery of service. This is financing. It's not incompatible. Well, you know, people who come and talk to me about that, they all sound like you, and they're just kind of chip. That's right, we're chipping away. 
And she gets up eventually, uh, uh, a few minutes later, it was, it was really nice to see you, Clint. It was great to see you, Senator. And by the way, Senator, we're going to keep chipping away. And she says, keep on chipping. I thought that was really pretty cool. <laughs> I, I thought that was great. And, and as a matter of fact, tomorrow, on, yeah, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, there's going to be a climate change march. And so people are finally fed up with kind of a tepid pr 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 protestation against carbon fuels. And there's going to be 100,000 people in D.C. And there's going to be people throughout the country. And so the thing is, we've got to keep chipping away. And finally, now, a while later, I ran into Dembro. And I said, well... Mike, I just saw Senator Anderson, and she said, you know, he, he said, you know, I, I did too, and she just agreed to support the bill. I think you softened her up. <laughs> now, maybe that's just bullshit, but I want to think that's really what happened, because what happened is that when you talk to someone, and even though they don't say, okay, I'm on your side, you're seeding them. It's, you're seeding them for something to happen later, I used to be in the insurance business a long, long time ago, and, and people will say no, but the next agent that comes by will say yes, because we're all prospecting for each other, okay? So now, I just want to close in saying that Nelson Mandela said, you know, it, look, it, it always looks impossible until it's done. That's what he says. And of course, King said, Martin Luther King, that history, the arc of history is long, but it bends toward justice. Only if you do the bending. And so that's what we do in a, in a democracy against all odds. We've got to have the people come out and bend. And, and finally, there's, there's an acronym. It's called ACT. A-C-T. And I don't remember what the hell. No. A-C-T. A is accept. You've you got to accept what's going on here. Okay. C is that you've got to choose to see how you'd like it to come out. And T is, guess what T is? take action. And that's what we're doing today. We're going to take action and we're going to learn to go down there and not mind being rebuffed or, or whatever. We're, we're going to go and see. And so what are we going to do? We are going to hang in there and we're going to persevere. Health care for all Oregon. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I'm just going to say a few things about the goals for our local trainers. And um, you know, keep in mind that ultimately what we're doing is um, training other trainers to recruit and train um, trainers to actually train the lobbies themselves. So um, our, our task is a little bit different. Um, but ultimately, remember, like with what Cliff said, that um, we are fighting against, we're organizing people power versus money power. And um, we need to really um, make that clear when we're um, communicating with the trainers, and um, and I think it's helpful for us to have consistent talking points um, for that, um, and make sure that you know there's so many different issues. Our trainers don't have to cover everything, um, but being consistent with the most important talking points, I think, will be helpful. At the same time, we should also think about um, recruiting um, specialized constituencies. Um, for instance, um, I want to really recruit um, teachers and public um, education workers. Um, because we're, you know, we're um, 80,000 people organized through both AFT and OVA, and um, we suffer from budget issues all the time, and um, it's really difficult for um, our legislators to raise funds for schools that they want, which they want to do because they are afraid of raising taxes. But if we can argue that we can save money. Um, with a better healthcare system and fund schools that way, I think we could reach some legislators that way. But um, this idea of thinking about these specialized constituencies and also um, in, with that in mind as well, um, keeping in mind um, equity um, and diversity as well. For instance, um, one of the groups within our coalition is APANO, and I've been going to some of their meetings um, after um, Camilo um, brought me to one. And we can you know, communicate the fact that we are not just recruiting, um, not, we don't just have individual lobbyists that are part of this, but we have people that are within coalitions and unions that are organized, and they are not just individual citizens or um, people in Oregon, but represent large organized groups. For instance, APANO, their goal is to, um, each year, 
um, register 4,500 new registered voters um, as they become naturalized. They have a goal of um, reaching 50,000 voters and translating um, their materials into seven different languages um, and also making um, 2,000 personal calls in 11 different languages. So we have the ability to mobilize many different people in many different, um, different groups. And so keeping that in mind, um, I think the important thing for us is to help build the trainer's confidence and um, keep them energetic to recruit um, more trainers and to sustain people within this movement. So that's all I have to say. Thanks, Jim. So now we're uh, going to Larry Stewart. He's uh, mentioned as a retired academic. He was a communications professor at Portland State and has some uh, interesting perspectives on how to communicate. Do I need this? Yes, yes. Yep. There's All right. people hard of hearing. All right. Um, <laughs> like me. Yeah. In the okay, I right got there. <laughs> um, first begin. Um, how many people here believe that uh, the United Universal Health Care is the best thing for this country? All right. No news there. Uh, Maybe besides good. world peace. <laughs> how many of you think it's inevitable? Hmm. Uh, how many, how many of you can come up with a valid reason why we shouldn't have universal health care? Anyone? A valid reason why we should oh, not valid. have universal health care? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, that's all good news, and I want to say that's our greatest strength. Uh, you mentioned we need to build confidence among the lobbyists. And the certainty in those points of view and the understanding that it's supported is, I think, our greatest strength, and that's where we need to come from. Uh, but when we're talking to uh, legislators, or anyone else for that matter, I think we can take uh, confidence in the idea that what we, what we know is correct. And uh, giving that confidence, if there's somebody that thinks otherwise, when you talk to a legislator, for instance, if they don't agree with you, that's either because they don't know, they need the information, and I find that really hard to believe in this day and age, or they don't care, which is less difficult to believe, uh, and maybe they're only interested in the next election, I don't know. But if you attribute the highest motives to your audience, as I think we ought to do, then you can ask their assistance. And this is a little different approach from what's listed here, but I don't think it's, it's antithetical to any of that. I don't, don't think it's negative. But we can ask them, help me, if you can, uh, why is it that um, we're the only country in the world, uh, the only um, uh, um, industrialized country in the world, that doesn't enjoy universal health care? Are there any good reasons for that? I don't think you'll find any. Um, are there, um, I'm curious as, uh, to know that, do you agree that um, uh, there would be enough savings in universal health care to pay for the, not only the salary and fees of all physicians in the country, uh, but also their education and preventable health care? Um, is that something that you can support? Uh, and so on. Um, why is it that health care bank is the leading the cost of health care is the leading cause the leading cause of bankruptcy in this country um, we're, if, if, you, if that's not the case uh, I'd really like to know about it why is it uh, that we continue to allow 48,000 people a year to die from lack of health insurance um, and I need some help with this. I believe that health insurance is important to universal health care, and these are some of the reasons. And if there are reasons to disagree with that, I'd really like to know uh, what, they, uh, what they might be, uh, and thereby initiate a conversation about that. I, I wouldn't uh, stick to the 48,000 number. Now, now that Obamacare is in being implemented, oh, that, that, like, that's it's, it's going down. down. Um, so try not to be so specific about the 48,000. All right. Right. That's it's um, more. Mm -hmm. What's that? Is it increasing with hospitals? More. According to Gerald Friedman's uh, 
research. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I, I need to see it before I could count on them. Tens of thousands. Yeah, still tens of thousands every year. Well, go ahead. Uh, there's a couple things I want to mention, and we'll talk more about this later on too, but uh, a primary method, a primary method of talking with anyone about why we need this is to talk about personal examples of people who have gone bankrupt or have had to go without health care. Oh, sure. Uh, none of the things I'm saying here would obviate all of that other kinds of uh, evidence, mm -hmm. personal stories, testimony, mm -hmm. and the kinds of things that, um, uh, that, that cause you, people to think about it. All that should be there yeah. to back up what we're saying. So, and so when you talk about the different types of arguments of why they would argue against it, you know, one argument that is from basically a religious or um, it's it's not true truly religious but it's a uh, what is kind of a religious approach of saying that everybody should be individual and responsible for their own activities and responsible for them, themselves and so there's that individual responsibility that's considered an American value that is almost a religion for some people and then there's the business approach of saying well if we put more costs on business it's going to drive business out which of course is if wrong, I can present but, you with some, but that's an argument that will be brought and so we need to be prepared to count and we need to be prepared for those kinds of arguments especially the uh, individual um, uh, responsibility thing um, at that point if, if you get into that conversation with someone uh, we can talk about what are the limits of, uh, of that responsibility and to what extent uh, do we care for others? Um, if you see a person uh, sick on the street or uh, somebody leaves a baby in, on your doorstep uh, or um, somebody uh, is thrown out of a job and uh, suddenly doesn't have any ability to pay for all for no reason of their own, that we should abandon those people in the society. I, I don't think that's what you're saying, but is that what you mean? Uh, I'd, I'd like to interject as the organizer that we probably should wait, hold on to your questions so that Larry gets his full opportunity to speak. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wait, 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 Larry, well, can I, can I just ahead, ask a real quick question though about your method here? Because I think I hear a method which is I'm not making an argument, I'm asking a question and eliciting the other side. Absolutely. So, 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 so I just want to bring that out. Okay. And I'm doing that under the underlying assumption that I believe this is true, the thing about universal health care. And I can honestly say, if there are reasons not to believe in that, then I want to know what that is, especially as an advocate. I want to know what it is. So please help me with that. Tell me why that's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. right? Tell me why it's not a good idea that after uh, if the, ex the uh, expense item comes up, that it would be less out of money pocket, uh, out of pocket money for all of us, even after taxes, to have that universal health care so that everyone is taken care of from cradle to grave. Um, and if they say, well, that's not a fact, it hasn't improved. Would you be interested, sir, if I could provide you with some of that information from the World Health Organization and other um, nonprofit organizations around the world who have uh, demonstrated that point? Would you be interested in that literature? Um, and uh, because I would be interested if that was not true. So um, it's a different. It is a different kind of an approach, uh, but in some ways it's an honest one. I really do want to know if there's a reason against this sort of thing. We have to ask the timekeeper whether there's time for questions. There is. Okay. Uh, she, was, she was waiting first. Well, it's not a okay, question. Sir. It's some information. I think the basic reason or the basic thing, everybody probably thinks it's a pretty good thing. Logically, it's good. But we have the capitalism thing. We have where the, the uh, odds are that they're going to have more lobbyists, they're going to have more uh, lawyers, they're going to have, just like Elizabeth Warren is saying about everything that's going on. I'm it's, really glad you brought that up. It's, that's what we have to, we have right. it does has nothing to do with what would be better, it has something to do with who's going to make more money. Well, it has to do with what are the arguments for and against and what are we doing here and what are the issues surrounding universal health care. And that one is the last one to come up, it seems to me. You know, one of the ways I would deal with that is, well, deal with the understanding that the last resort of the politician would be to say, uh, and I got this one from David Young, that it's not politically feasible. Yes. 
right? And I think you can regard that as a self-confirming prophecy. As long, you're absolutely right, sir. As long as politicians are saying it's politically unfeasible, then it will be unfeasible. And the reason it's unfeasible, then, is I'm, I can't understand why the politicians aren't saying what's written on the wall and what's best for the constituency. I'd like you to address that issue, if you would, please. Uh, Camilo. I think that the focus of our argument should always be on universality. I think that perhaps even some of those politicians who don't support Obamacare support the concept of universality. Mm -hmm. And the argument that Cliff referred to that Senator Anderson made about, well, I want to wait and see what happens with Obamacare. I want to wait and see what happens with the Oregon transformation is belied by the fact that the predictions that were made over a year ago about how many people would be covered have been borne out. We knew over a year ago that there were 600,000 people in Oregon who were not covered and that once fully implemented, it would still be 200,000. So any politician who indicates a position in favor of universality has to explain how it is that we can tolerate 200,000 people being uninsured. And what, what that means in terms of the question about the uh, liability, the consequences of not having insurance. Research was done that shows roughly for every 100,000 people who are not covered, 100 will die. And I think this is the, the reality that people have to confirm and explain why they can tolerate that situation. The more you can be that specific when things come up specific about those issues, uh, then again you can ask, uh, I'm, I would like to know how, how and why we should continue to tolerate that condition. Um, because it's not you and I that's going to make the difference, it's the person that casting the votes, as was put up for us. Go ahead. So two quick things. One is, um, I think one of the things that Larry's talking about is, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I think one of the things Larry's talking about is that, you know, this comes back to the very age-old adage of um, a fool convinces me with their reason, or tries to convince me with their reasons, and a wise man convinces me with my with their own, with my own. Thinking, I'm sorry. And and so that means, you know, get the person to tell you their reasons to support. Of care for all, and and by asking them the questions, and then exploring the issue with them, and, and hopefully, if, if they don't have just a, you know a rock for a heart, you know they they have some reason within their own family or their own experience, their own life that they can relate. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is is uh, the uh, adage that my rabbi sometimes tells about um, that there's a bunch of people in a, in a uh, life raft, a lifeboat, and, uh, and everybody's got a seat, and uh, you know, one guy takes a, a, a drill out, and he starts drilling below his seat, and everybody says, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that. He says, but it's my seat, I can do what I want. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, obviously, <laughs> That's, I think, something that's, that's illustrative of, of how this is in, in that in healthcare. I mean, this is, this is a, a public health thing. So, and we're all in it together. And, you know, the air, we all breathe the air. Yeah, we can sum up, I think, some of, that, some of that conversation that you're talking about with asking again, what are the benefits of, them, of the status quo as you see it? One minute. What are the benefits of the status quo? If you're against universal health care, um, what are the benefits of that um, <coughs> over the advocacy for universal health care? And I think it's, it's I think it's okay to ask those questions rather than pump information. <clears throat> if they need information, that's terrific. But um, if they have a point of view, then information isn't necessarily going to change it. But getting them to think about their own position and having to justify it. Uh, might make a difference, it seems to me. Um, I would also come back to two things that I learned from Sam Metz 
One is that it's not the moral suasion that gets it. One of the things that I've discovered over watching the NFL, the National <laughs> Football League, in the last few weeks is that the moral, the moral differences, the moral suasion isn't what changes policy, it's money. Um, and with the politicians, it's how are you going to get elected next year. Um, <coughs> Lisa is going to talk about um, uh, media events and so on. And one of the questions I would like to ask them in, in that regard is, is that the position that, that I should tell my friends that you're taking with regard to this issue? Or when I report to the media, how is it that you would like me to explain your opposition to universal health care? Put it to them. I mean, that's what they're about, and that's what we're for, and we're asking information, more information. We want to know uh, what the issues are. Um, I would also then come back to Stan Metz's um, adage, and I think it should be our mantra. Uh, wherever we go, whoever we talk to, it ought to end up with something like better care for more people for less money. And how can you be against that? Better care for more people for less money. Any way you cut it, whatever issue we look at, it comes back to that. And so um, one last thing, if the, uh, if the lobbyist or anybody else we talk to coming up, continues to come up with obscure reasons or requests for more information like, uh, could you tell me the incidence of uh, uh, health insurance differences between Japan and Europe and us, and so on. And you could then ask, how does that then relate to the specific issues that we're talking about? And how would it make a difference one way or the other? And avoid those, those kinds of arguments, those kinds of, of leading off into specifics uh, that isn't going to speak to the issue. More care, better care for more people for less money. Uh, and if we keep coming back to that point, I think we can continue to, continue to make a difference. Thanks, Cliff. Thank uh, who am I and why am I here? Uh, some of you are old enough to remember that uh, that's what uh, Vice Presidential Candidate James B. Stockdale <laughs> used to introduce himself in the oh, yeah. Vice Presidential Candidate of 1992 as he ran as Ross Burroughs uh, running mate against Al Gore and uh, Dan Quayle. Who am I and why am I here? And some of you might be asking that question of me as I'm in front of you this afternoon. Who am I and why am I here? Indeed, my name is Tim Roach, and that name doesn't bug me anymore. I got over that years ago. <laughs> also, uh, I should, uh, full disclosure, I'm not a uh, user of cannabis, but uh, some people still associate that with me. <laughs> <laughs> to be uh, totally honest, uh, most of you probably are more active and have been active longer in the cause of universal single-payer health care uh, than I have been, uh, yet for some reason Mike puts me in front of you this afternoon. Now, I might be here because uh, for over 40 years I was a Presbyterian minister. Well, still am for that matter, but I'm retired. And I was a fairly active, uh, socially mindful minister, and so uh, I've made my share of pitches and a few legislative visits, so maybe that's why I'm in front of you this afternoon. Or it might be that I'm here this afternoon because of the passion that I have for universal single-payer health care. My passion was uh, there naturally as a part of my Christian concern, but uh, it also has been there if I can get my sheet right to make sure I'm following my script. Yeah, my passion has been there personally as uh, I journeyed as a minister with individuals and families over the years as they experienced their own health care crisis and journeyed into our health care system. But I have to tell you that my personal passion was given a tremendous boost in 2013 after I spent four consecutive months just a few blocks over the way at OHSU with my wife as she did battle with myelodysplastic syndrome and ultimately succumbed to that disease. Having experienced the trauma and the hospitalization and the death of a loved one as a member of my own family or as a loved one member of my congregation, I can attest to the fact that uh, it's totally different when you walk that walk with someone you care for. A passion can be born, and that passion was born in me. 
And so almost a year ago to the day, I became active in the cause of universal single-payer health care as I joined HCAO and became a part of Mike's traveling troop. But I have to tell you, I worry about individuals and families and communities and indeed our country when we allow a health care crisis to be compounded by a financial calamity and an emotional strain like none other you would ever experience in your life. People struggling for health and life should not be made to worry, to struggle for financial well-being, to see their life savings washed away. And so I am active in the cause of universal single-payer health care and HCAO. It's my personal hope that no individual or no family would ever have to go through the trauma of a health care calamity. But as we all know, illness and death are part and parcel of this journey that we call life. But as those of us gathered here today also know, any patient, any household, any family should not have their financial well-being traumatized and threatened simply because they've had the misfortune of becoming ill and needing health care. So that's why I am here today. Why are you here? If you don't have an answer to that simple question, why are you here? I encourage you to get one, and get one very quickly. Know who you are and why you are involved in the cause of universal single-payer health care, and be able to communicate that in a crisp, concise way to whoever you talk to. You see, it's one thing to let them know what your message is. It's another thing to let them know who you are as the person behind that message. Because I think that really is what drives home the message with whomever you're speaking to. Something like a sixth of our nation's economy is the health care system. We're going to be up, indeed we already are, up against the quintessential example of big business and the power we have to combat the money and the resources of that big business is the power of our story and our person. So I encourage us all to develop that story, to know your identity, and to be able to communicate that. So one thing, if you were doing this as a faith group, and in a specific faith group, one suggestion would be, I think Tim did this um, for the Presbyterians, is to find out your faith groups, um, your mission statement or statement on health care, and start with that. And insert that where Tim inserted it, and make sure that that's loud and clear, because you can you know, use that to put your other comments on very good, okay. 30 seconds. I want to uh, reflect on a number of things that have been said. I think uh, the message that we just heard from Tim was really compelling. It speaks to you as an individual. And we are going to be working one-to-one, -one, trying to reach other individuals. However, there was another point made earlier that is that we have to reach out to constituencies. So we have to think not only how do we make a compelling message from one person to another, but we have to reach organizations. We know, as Cliff pointed out, that we have to convince the legislature. And he said that we're going to go through this using our voices, but we need to have a voice that is organized and a voice that has a mass impact, and that's going to require reaching out to organizations, and we have to make them feel this as much as we do as individuals. Well, right much. after the, the February 4th lobbying effort, I was thinking, you know, it'd really be great to talk to a conservative. I try to avoid them, but <laughs> I said, oh, okay, a Republican. The, let's, let's find a Republican brain out there, okay? So I found the most, I think, at, at least this is what people told me, one of the most conservative legislators, Jim, Jim, Jim Wiedner, who represents House District 24. So 
I called his office and I said, I'd like to speak to the to to the state rep. May I make an appointment? Well, he's really booked, but I'll tell you what, he's got a little bit of time in between meetings. So if you can get down here on a particular date between you know two and two twenty or something, he'll be out of one meeting and going to the other. And I said, okay. So I'm just saying this because you've got to be a little bit flexible, and you never know how it's going to come about. So I, I, I got down there. I went up to his office and introduced myself to the, his, his representative, and he said, yeah, he's have a seat there. He should be here. And by God, a couple minutes later, he walked up, and I said, Representative Weidner, I'm Cliff Goldman. I'd like to talk to you. I tried to get an appointment, but I'm just going to have to... to I'm, I'm just going to have to catch you. And he said, walk with me. Is this God or something? Walk with me. Oh, oh, okay. He's going to a meeting. And so I said, yeah, Cliff Goldman, uh, health healthcare for all Oregon, and we want to get a... You know, da, 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 da. And so he said, well, you, you know, Europe's really having a hard time with this, and if you're an employer, you've got all kinds of problems and people who don't want to work. Da, 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 da. And so the, 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 the door was coming to where he was going to dodge into and about 50 more, 50, in about 50 to 100 more feet. Even though I, even though there was an increase of stuttering, I did, I did manage to say, "Oh, you're a business owner." He said, "Yes, I am." Well, well, wouldn't it be great if your next negotiation you wouldn't even have to deal with their health care? Imagine that. You don't even have to talk about that. And he goes. Okay, bye-bye. And then, and then he went into his meeting. And now I noticed later that he he voted against the bill, but, but uh, that's okay because there because I there I seeded something there. And and by the way, you're not going to get everyone on your side, but fortunately, most people in the state are for this idea. But it was fun to do that, and there may have been a little jolt there. Well, I guess there is, is something there. And there is a hand out there. I, I have, have, have about a minute to go here. I, I think I can, I can do that. And I take two minutes to find out what my time is. I, I, I get a minute and 40 seconds. If you had universal health care, you could remove business owners from the health care management business. And that's what I think he kind of, yeah. Keep health care costs predictable. Keep employees full and part-time healthy and productive. I can't come in today. I'm not feeling well. I'll be going to the doctor. I can't. I'll take a point. Okay. Provide employees with, with competitive health care benefits. Keep productive employees from seeking benef better benefits at another company. Assure health care independent of labor management and negotiations. And that was the main thing is that he didn't have to be bothered with this. His really great employee is not going to ditch him because they can go to the dentist if they work for that guy. I mean, only in America can this happen. And so, as a representative of Wiener, thank you for that experience. It was fun to seed you like a plane seeds a cloud. I'm still waiting for rain. Thank you very much. Okay, now, <laughs> we are done with that segment. Yeah. I had one uh, with Kenner. We talked to Kenmer when he was between meetings and uh, basically said, you know, and uh, the person who was voted the greatest Canadian was a legislator who got health care in. And I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if your legacy was uh, getting health care in and you were considered the greatest legislator ever? And good, just, good, good, very good. Thank you. I'd love to hear that story because I actually met with Bill Kenmer about a year and a half ago and said exactly the same thing to him. I said, you know, are you prepared to be the next uh, Tommy Douglas for, for Oregon? And he looked at me and sort of said, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so I'm Gene L. Poff, and I was one of the Mantis Health doctors uh, five years ago that toured across the country with Mike and some others, and, and we had a great time and talked to probably three or 4,000 people over that time, and had a chance to do a lot of interviews uh, on camera for TV stations in the various localities where we had uh, sort of gatherings and, and town hall meetings. Uh, interestingly, I, I wanted to comment that at the 40-some town hall sessions we had, 
I think there were only two people who stood up at, at any of these altogether, a total of two, who said they didn't agree with the idea of universal health care. So we thought that either we were talking to the choir or something, that this is a very widespread belief that we need to do this. So I had the chance to do quite a few interviews, um, and I guess that's why Mike asked me to talk about this. Um, so let me share my perspectives about this, because you all may have a chance to do this, and the people you'll be training may have a chance to do this. The first thing is to recognize that the person who's coming with the TV cameraman and is going to interview you and ask you questions about uh, health care reform is going to be somebody who's on assignment. You know, that's a job, a her job. And so they really kind of want to get in and out. They don't want a long, long discussion. They want to come there and have a chance to get a few sound bites and talking points. And so what we want to do is make reasonably sure that those sound bites or those talking points are spot on, that they're quotable, that they will get shown on the news. I gave one of my best interviews in, uh, I think it was in Cleveland. Um, just a great, I thought I was spot on. The guy I was interviewing was really sympathetic. He spent a lot more time. We must have taped 20 minutes of interviews. So I couldn't wait till that evening so I could watch the news and see how, how much is covered. I got upstaged by a car accident. <laughs> okay? So you really need to make it sharp. And the way to make it sharp is by having a good point. Understand that the person who's interviewing you is not Queen Elizabeth. You know, you don't have to be intimidated. You don't have to be nervous about it. This is an ordinary person who is going to have some questions, maybe prepared. And I tend, when I first start talking to them, before we get the camera rolling, to say, um, so tell me about, you know, your background, where'd you go to school, what'd you do? And try to find some way of establishing some rapport. Because if they feel like I'm a good guy, and they're a good guy, and I like them, they're going to be more sympathetic in how they phrase the question and less combative. <laughs> so try to establish that rapport before you even begin the interview. The next thing that I think is really valuable to do is to <coughs> offer some questions for them to ask. Um, they may have questions. They may have heard something or read something that they think is valuable. But if you have some questions that are ones that you've got a really bang up answer for, <coughs> it's really nice to say, many people ask about such and such. I know a lot of people are interested. Maybe you, know, you could ask this in a way that would be appropriate for your viewers. And in doing that, it sort of primes the pump so that they're ready to ask the question as a sort of a softball pitch that makes it easier for you to say, oh, I'm really glad you asked this because here's how I feel about it. Um, the final thing I would say is don't be intimidated by the need to kind of give the whole history of healthcare reform. You know, they're going to want to have a minute or two at most of sound bites. And so it's best to limit yourself to one or maybe two, rarely three, uh, points that you want to make. You can talk about factual stuff like, you know, how many uh, women die in childbirth in the United States compared to Canada. Um, and that will have a, a certain viewer audience. You can talk about the cost and the budget, because heaven knows everybody's worried about taxes and the cost and the budget. You can talk about moral issues. I think moral issues are very appropriate. Oftentimes when I was talking with people uh, outside of the camera, I would say, you know, as a physician, I really believe my duty is to take care of my patients, and I think everybody deserves to have health care. And I think it's a human right, and I think that's the reason why we should have universal health care. But if you don't believe that, if you don't believe in universal health care, you think other people should be responsible, then let's just talk about the finances. Let's talk about the cost. And it's going to cost a lot less for me to spend $10 a month on somebody's blood pressure medicine than to have them in the emergency room for 10 minutes when they have their stroke. So those are the kinds of things that you can present. Now, in preparing for coming in today, I thought, Something that might be useful for all of you and to hand on to other people will be flashcards. So I have made a bunch of flashcards. And I, unfortunately, 
looking at them as you were sitting here, I realized there's a lot of hy typos, so I'm not going to pass them out. But I will get, <laughs> I will get them for anybody who wants them. Um, and they come like this on a sheet, A to a sheet. Oh. One side is the question, socialized medicine, rationing, waste and inefficiency, taxes are already too high, what care would be covered, uh, why don't doctors support single payer, and so on. And on the back side is a short, terse, tight, soundbite kind of response. And so I will get these for anybody who wants them. And they can be reproduced. Yeah. But <clears throat> what it means is that you have ways of of taking this and so you're going to practice, you can read this. Why don't don't we have the world's best medical care system? Sadly, America ranks ranks about thirty sixth in the world in overall health care outcomes, trailing countries such as Cyprus, Morocco, Portugal, and Colombia. American women have twice the risk of dying in pregnancy of women in Canada, and during the first year of our life, our infants die more than twice as often as Swedish babies. Italians, in fact, live more than three years longer than we do. Short, to the point. So, so anyway, I'll, I'll quit there. Um, the media can also be, come at it from an oppositional point of view. So if you have that happen, be prepared. Come back to your talking points. I once had a, a, a somebody ask one of my members when I worked for Acorn, isn't Acorn a communist organization? <laughs> <laughs> the guy went, uh, 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 you know, and that's what they showed on the news that night. Yeah. I, I swear to God, I, you know, that is what they showed on the news. So had he said, well, you know, if if you believe that asking for streetlights is communist, I guess, but you know we're just out here, we want streetlights, then that would have been coming back to our message and, and you know, defeating his, his ridiculous claim. Several years ago, Regions Blue Cross Blue Shield was uh, requesting a 22% increase in its rates from the state insurance division and <laughs> there were a few people who got kind of outraged about it. How many people were at that demo? Chris was there? Anyway, uh, and, and it even pissed off the state insurance division. And for the first time in years, they decided to have a hearing on this rate request. So Jobs with Justice Healthcare had a rally at the uh, thing, and we went inside, and, and, and I was outraged. I wanted to tell the, uh, the insurance division about my outrage, and, but I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm 30 years a nurse, and I, I didn't know what to say. I asked Margaret Butler, and we owe her a huge debt, by the way. Anyway, uh, she said, David, you're a nurse. People want to hear what nurses have seen. Uh -huh. so, so my turn came, and I had five minutes. <laughs> no, I had less than that. I had three minutes. Uh, the, uh, I said, I'm an operating room nurse, and I do a lot of vascular cases, which is to say diseases of the blood or the blood vessels. And when you're a vascular operating room nurse, you do amputations. Somebody comes into the operate into the uh, emergency room, their toe has turned black. The ER has no choice but to call the vascular surgeon. The vascular surgeon has no choice but to take that toe off. We try to be as conservative as we can, but sometimes that's not good enough, and we have to take the foot off. And sometimes that's not good enough, and we have to decide, are we going to take off that leg above or below the knee? Silence in the room. The, the commissioners were just stunned. And so for those of us in the uh, healthcare provision business, I really recommend being a witness to what you have seen. It's almost as good as having a real sufferer from the injustices of our healthcare system or 
our so-called system, testifying. And uh, nurses should use this as much as they can. They keep doing polls year after year. What's the most respected profession in the country? And almost universally, it's the registered nurses. Uh, shortly after 9-11, firefighters were number one, but we're back there again. So, we, and, and it's no accident that <coughs> nurses are a huge part of the health care reform movement. I went to uh, a <coughs> meeting of the labor campaign for single payer in D.C. three, four years ago. 22% of the delegates were nurses. So, um, did I cover my points? Oh, the, the other one I use a lot is having been uh, a trauma OR nurse for 25 plus years, I can tell you that every one of us, no matter our station, no matter if we eat organic every day, if we get plenty of exercise, go to the gym, we are all of us one banana peel away from total financial physical and emotional disaster. That's a good hook to get a discussion going about the need for health care reform. The, uh, as far as labor goes, how am I doing? About a half minute. Okay, we can fit that in. I was at the labor campaign for single payer conference in Oakland several weeks ago. And I, and I was concerned about how to approach the uh, longshoremen here in Portland, so I asked the, our host down there, who was president of his longshore local, and he said it's very simple. If you want to control costs, and unions are very much concerned about how to control the costs of health care, because workers have universally been giving up raises for years and years just to try to keep their heads above water on the health care front. And look where it's gotten them. But he says if you want to control costs, you have to get everybody in. And he meant by that more than just your workers, everybody in. Okay, questions? So, I think, what, what would you, if I were running a group and I had a guy or a woman in my group who says, well, I'm a union member, how do I talk as a union member to my legislator? What, what would you say to somebody about how to speak from a labor perspective to a legislator? Well, you could, you could recount what, I, what I've just said. That we have been giving up. Our, our wages have been flat for the several decades now just to try to keep up with the increase in the cost of health care. 